My name is Elton and this is a mini-series on my channel where I'll be taking a look at artifact sets that have similar effects and uses, specifically for characters who can utilize them well but have to go through some sort of constant debate of which one to choose. I hope to shed some light on how these sets differ and whether the trade-offs that each of them have are actually worth it, as well as how units can actually proc these effects properly. However, like always, I have to give a disclaimer. I'm not here to calculate percentages or crunch the numbers on any character's damage output. I am only here to explain how these artifacts work, how well they work in the current state of the game, and how well these effects can be taken advantage of. I am not here to shame, humiliate, or insult anyone who chooses one set over another for their builds. I also want to say that I do compile my information from the most up-to-date guides from the Kaching Mains website, as they have a plethora of very helpful information, so if you're wondering where I got all this knowledge, I got it from there. Now, with all that said and done, welcome to Artifact and Tagney. So today's episode of Artifact and Tagney is going to be quite lengthy, as the amount of information that I will be discussing will pretty much include many varying scenarios, builds, and points in the Genshin gameplay timeline that will hopefully depict the capabilities of these artifacts well. It's been a while since my last episode, so I'm glad that you've been patient with me. To be a little bit open about my personal life, I took a full time again at my job, so I have a lot less time to make videos, and trust me, as much as I want to power a video like every damn day, I don't exactly have the energy to do so. So I really thank everyone for being very understanding and patient. And now that I've said what I needed to say on that, let's get on to the part of the video y'all want to see. Like I said before, this video is going to be quite long, so please get comfortable. Now, elemental skills are a huge part of all characters' kits. Arguably, they're even more important than the elemental bursts. This is due to the fact that they can help characters gain energy for their burst, with a few exceptions, of course. And when it comes down to the two artifact sets that I'll be talking about today, it really helps to put into perspective the roles that these characters who rely on their elemental skills play in the game. Tenacity of the Millilith gives a 20% increase in HP to the equipped character with its two-piece effect. Its four-piece effect states that when the elemental skill of the equipped character hits an opponent, the attack and shield strength of that character will be increased by 20% and 30% respectively for 3 seconds. This effect can occur every 0.5 seconds. This effect can also be activated even when the equipped character isn't on field. Golden Troop's 2-piece effect increases elemental skill damage by 20% while its 4-piece effect increases elemental skill damage by an additional 25% while increasing it another 25% if the equipped character is off-field. This additional off-field increase will expire 2 seconds after the equipped character comes back onto the field. So just by simply looking at the artifacts, we can discern the telltale difference between the two. It's the classic dichotomy of damage versus support. This has been a theme that has time and time again appeared in the series, and once you understand this concept, it becomes super easy to discern what kind of characters want to use these sets. This of course, given the fact that these units have to have their elemental skills proc consistently enough, and when they are off-field as well. Tenacity of the Millilith events for support units, who hopefully happen to scale properly off of HP, while the Golden Troop set is meant for more sub-DPS units, who deal most of their damage through their elemental skills. There are also some situations where Tenacity of the Millilith can be used on characters who don't scale off of HP for anything in their kit, so those are the more niche cases that I'll be discussing at the end. And as for Golden Troop, for characters who need to be on field for their skill attacks, the two-piece effect with another two-piece of a different artifact set can help suffice in those areas too. However, these sort of characters who use their skill as their main source of damage have other sets to benefit them instead, since that is how the game usually works, by having other artifact sets to boot. Now, the breakdown of the part of this video was super short, since these artifacts are pretty self-explanatory without needing much additional elaboration. However, the character parts will be a lot more lengthy. And that's because there are a whopping 17 characters that I have to discuss. So seriously, I hope you've gotten yourself well situated. Abedo has been the only known Geo sub DPS for a long while. Like I discussed in my previous videos about the Geo artifact sets, Albedo was not only in a really bad spot timing wise for wishing manners, but also artifact wise. His release wasn't even a year into Genshin, and the Husk of Odd and the Dream set had yet to be released. This is because of his unique scaling of defense for a massive portion of his damage within his skill, and until Husk came by to not only boost defense and geo damage, he was sort of stuck in a permanent limbo. 
There were earlier reckonings from some players who were smart enough to utilize him as a support, given the fact that despite him not scaling off of HP, he could still consistently proc the effective tenacity of the Millilith, but that soon became a very unfavorable set after Husk's release and then Golden Troops, with the release of Fontaine. Not to mention, Zhongli was just better at using that set while also being Geo. To be fair, it was also kind of bad since Albedo would usually be paired with him as well, and tenacity does not stack. Golden Troop made a lot of sense for Albedo, however, as he would only spend a second on field to place down his skill after it expired, and while Husk and Golden Troop were a close competition, Golden Troop ultimately won out in the end by a marginal percent, specifically if you do have his event weapon, Cinnabar Spindle. This also makes sense over tenacity since Albedo is obviously a more damaged focus unit anyways. Next up, we have Charlotte. Her skill is able to mark opponents with her camera, allowing for it to deal cryo damage to each opponent marked, up to a max of 5 opponents every 1.5 seconds. There is also another version of her skill where you hold down her elemental skill longer, and it will activate and apply the same mark, but that mark ends up dealing more damage. However, if you do so, the cooldown of that skill form is longer. If you use the base form of the skill, the duration of the mark is 6 seconds and the cooldown is 12, while the stronger, longer version has a mark duration of 12 seconds while the cooldown is 18. Regardless of either one you use, Charlotte's skill proc will always have a downtime of 6 seconds, meaning that tenacity doesn't work since her skill isn't consistent enough. Even though her first passive does help out a bit by reducing the cooldown of her skill, it only works if opponents are defeated, that isn't enough to boot. Not to mention that Charlotte doesn't even scale off of HP. And since Charlotte is a healer, she's already geared as a support role. While their healing and damage do scale off of attack, she doesn't deal enough damage to be put on Golden Troop. Her damage multipliers aren't high enough. I already included Charlotte in a video before where I discussed the Song of Days Past set, and she's probably best suited for that. The fact that she's able to heal everyone so quickly can definitely be used to bolster team damage through that set, so neither Tenacity or Golden Troop is good for her. Moving on to Dea, she has had quite the tumultuous journey in the game. We all remember how disastrous her release was, where pretty much almost everyone was rioting and kind of telling Oyo to just buff her damage and make her more usable, such as incorporating her first two constellations into her base kit. And while I can't say she hasn't aged well or improved, unlike other units such as Kuki or Kakomi, her support actually really isn't all that bad. Her skill creates a field that essentially acts as a giant damage net, mitigating and redirecting a portion of taken damage to Dea specifically, while also dealing a hit of AoE pyro damage at intervals of 2.5 seconds. The damage dealt is based mainly on Dea's attack with just a tad of her HP. This means that Tenacity would be the best option for her since Dea doesn't do enough damage to justify putting her on Golden Troop set. Her damage absorption capabilities of her field is also based on 200% of her max HP, which after capping out, will no longer mitigate damage. Not to mention, her skill doesn't last long enough for her cooldown to be up, meaning that it's small damage that also happens to be inconsistent. However, the same issue arises with Tenacity. The duration of her skill is 12 seconds and the cooldown is 20. One way to somewhat get around this is to use her burst when her skill is active to put a stop on the duration and then replace it after her burst duration ends. However, that would mean that you would not only have to build a huge amount of energy recharge on her, but you would also be simultaneously wasting fuel time with her low DPS output. Also, in order to get those ER levels, putting her on Emblem of Severed Fate would have to be the strategy. But putting her on Emblem would be to make her more of a burst DPS, which is not the topic of this video. Getting back on track, the only way you could bypass the wretched cooldown is by giving her a sacrificial greatsword with a high enough refinement. The way Dea's skill works is that she deals an initial hit of pyro damage and then you can activate it again to place down her field to start the cooldown. Sacrificial greatsword can proc on either of these hits, resetting the cooldown of her skill. You're able to get her field out and essentially have 100% uptime on her skill. Additionally, it is important to note that Dea is currently the only pyro character who is able to activate tenacity of the Millis effect as of right now and have proper uptime with it, as long as you have her sack greatsword of course. Mitchell has been a pretty powerful sub DPS since the beginning of the game, and ever since Dendro's introduction she's only gone way better. Given that most of her playstyle involves her summoning Oz with her skill and then refreshing his duration on field with her burst or vice versa, Mitchell is obviously best suited for Golden Troop. There were builds in the past like a 2-piece Thundering Fury and 2-piece Attack 18%, which were her best before Golden Troop, and even a very Copium Tenacity of the Millilith build for her, which Fischl could proc. 
However, due to the fact that Fischl is a damage geared unit in addition to how she doesn't skill off of HP, putting her on tenacity is an absolute waste of time and resources. Golden Troop is definitely the way to go. Karina is also in a similar situation with Fischl. She's a sub DPS Hydra unit that deals a lot of damage with the Uzia version of her skill. And while her damage does scale off of HP and Tenacity's two-piece effect would definitely benefit from that, the four-piece effect ends up being a massive disservice to her damage output. Golden Troop is definitely the best for her. Her skill duration lasts longer than her cooldown, and her off-field playstyle makes her an extremely formidable off-field character. Yuki Shinobu is actually a pretty interesting case, as she's known to be the poster child of Hyperbloom, so neither of these sets are her go-tos. Hyperbloom is very powerful. It's simply activated by the usage of Kuki's skill, applying Electra to Dendro cores, and it deals damage based off of her character level and elemental mastery. It's super powerful since her healing also scales off an amount of her EM as well. Her best sets for this are either Flower of Paradise Lost or Gilded Dreams. These two sets increase Hyperbloom damage and increase elemental mastery respectively. In the case that these two sets, Tenacity is definitely the better set over Golden Troop. This is actually pretty surprising as Kuki is a support character in the classic sense of the role, but doesn't want that for her best playstyle. Now, Layla is a support character that aligns perfectly with Tenacity of the Millwith. Her kit revolves around her elemental skill Shield that has multiple hits. Her shield produces these night stars organically every 1.5 seconds, while whenever a character protected by her shield uses their elemental skill, the shield will produce two night stars, with this being able to happen every 0.3 seconds. Once the shield has accumulated a max of 4 stars, they will fire off and hit opponents, dealing crowd damage equal to a portion of Layla's attack. New night stars can't form until the pre-existing ones are done firing. Additionally, her burst summons a baby cradle toy looking thingy up in the sky that will shoot out starlight slugs that hit opponent every 1.5 seconds. And when a starlight slug hits, a night star will be generated for the shield. The burst effect can happen every 0.5 seconds. So with three different timers at 1.5, 0.3, and 0.5 seconds, Layla is always bound to have enough night stars to proc this effect. The Nasty's two piece effect is also very helpful to Layla's shield strength. And while you would think that since her skill hits quite often while she is off field, Golden Troop would be great for her. But the damage dealing for her night stars are extremely low, not even hitting a 50% damage multiplier. Not to mention it scales off of her attack, which is not a stat that she prioritizes. Even with her C6 increasing her skill and burst damage, it isn't enough of a reason to warrant her being put on Golden Troop. Even her C4 has a better ability of boosting a bit of normal and charge attack damage by 5% of her max HP after her night stars start firing, despite this effect only lasting 3 seconds and immediately being removed after 0.05 seconds when dealing that said normal or charge attack damage, essentially rendering it only good for one use per round of night stars firing. It's still an appreciated support effect to have. Another amazing user of Tenacity of the Millwith is Kokomi. She's a healer support unit that constantly applies Hydro off-field with the use of her elemental skill, and when she uses her burst with her jellyfish on field, Kokomi refreshes the duration of it. Her skill in the form of a jellyfish also happens to heal whoever is in the radius of its AoE. This healing is based off of Kokomi's HP, and it procs every 2 seconds, with an additional hit from placing it down. Kokomi is perfect for especially freeze teams, and the additional attack boost from the 4-piece effect of tenacity of the Millilith can snapshot for the best freeze DPS in the game, Ayaka. Kokomi as a support is very useful, meaning that tenacity is the best for her. Even if you build Kokomi as a sub-DPS of sorts, she has a passive where she can't even land any crit hits since it gives her essentially a minus 100% crit rate. This means that being on Golden Troop would pretty much just be completely wasted. And now we get to the poster child for this artifact set. Unli's kit revolves around his almost impenetrable shield. This is activated by him using his elemental skill to summon his pillar, which stays on field as a geo construct. It deals AoE geo damage when it resonates and causes other geo constructs around it to resonate as well. However, his shield is what really stands out in his kit. It has a perfect uptime and its strength is based on his max HP. And the resonating of this pillar checks off the requirement for Tenacity's 4 piece set as well. I will say that the only time that it doesn't really work well is when he summons his pillar, and then it immediately despawns due to the overlapping entities taking up the same space in the game, or when it has nothing to spawn on top of. And although Zhongli's main playstyle is to stay off field, the damage of the pillar is minimal, so increasing it will be pointless. It also doesn't make much sense since he typically wants to be built on HP, which does increase a portion of his damage based on that through his passive, but it still isn't enough to make up for his attack stat scaling for damage. 
And again, with this pillar potentially despawning every now and then, that means that the small damage is also inconsistent. And as for the last character I discussed before I get into the more niche and wonky ones, Yai Miku was a bit of her own situational case. Pre 3.0, she saw a heavy comparison with her four star counterpart, Fischl. Due to this comparison, she was given Fischl's best build at the time, two piece of Thundering Fury and any of the two piece 18% attack. Despite this, Yai Miku was still not preferred over Fischl. This was due to her not being able to be used well as an off field unit, or at the very least, not better than Fischl was as an off field unit. Her skill had three uses and a short cooldown, with a connection mechanic, allowing her skill to deal more damage when they're connected. However, what ends up happening is that her burst deletes them all on the field, while also resetting the cooldown of her burst via her passive. And while her burst deals a large chunk of damage, it has a 90 burst cost and a long cooldown of 22 seconds. Paired with her not producing a lot of energy, this means her rotations in a team that includes her burst isn't that worthwhile, but also extremely clunky, as you would have to use her skill three times, then burst, and then use her skill three times again. This led to some very copium strategies where Yaimiko could use Tenacity of the Millilith and follow in the footsteps of that very early copium support Fischl build. And just like Fischl, Yai scales off of attack, so this didn't really even go anywhere. And while in post 3.0, this rotation didn't change, but people did view her on-field playstyle much more favorably than before. This was due to the obvious shift of Electro being able to achieve higher damage multipliers with Aggravate, and a lot of players started capitalizing on Yai being a Catalyst user, so an on-field main DPS build was considered quite practical. Gilded Dreams became a good set for her to increase EM to deal more damage, especially with her second passive that provides a tiny push. However, when strictly talking about Tenacity and Golden Troop, Golden Troop is a better option since she can still be utilized as an off-field sub-DPS, more specifically in spread teams where an off-field Electro unit is needed. Now that I've finished discussing the more practical characters for either of these sets, we now have to get to the more situational ones. I would like to cover all my bases, so I am including them for the sake of being thorough. First up are the main DPSs who deal most of their damage with their skills. Navia and Hazo both have built-in skill nukes that deal a buttload of damage when pulled off properly. Navia deals more damage with every crystallized shard obtained by the party, and releases it in a magnificent umbrella cannon shot. And while this would seem like Golden Troop could help that, it fails in comparison to Nighttime in the Whispering Woods. Navia spends more time as a driver for herself with the Geo Infusion that she gets after she uses her skill. This allows her to create more crystallized shields for herself when attacking in tandem with other units who applied off-field elements. And her damage through her Geo Infusion is quite significant since it scales off of attack and Geo damage bonus like her skill. And while the two piece of Archaic Petra for a Geo damage bonus along with the two piece of Golden Troop can work, it just doesn't even begin to compete with their best in slot set. Same goes with Hazo. His skill is a massive air punch that knocks the wind out of opponents, pun intended, and this hit deals more damage when he gains stack from causing swirl reactions. And since he's an animal catalyst, that makes him a good driver for other teams, while simultaneously providing him increases to his own personal damage. You could use a two-piece of either Viridescent or Desert Pavilion, along with the two-piece of Golden Troop, if you want, but replacing two-piece of Golden Troop with a two-piece 18% attack, or just going with the full Viridescent would be best. We all know how broken Animo support is by now. Speaking of Animo, the next two units are even more situational. Sayu is an Animo healer who mainly plays a support role by just dropping down her burst and leaving the field. However, her elemental skill is a fun little barrel roll that can actually help as a driver in certain teams. Teams like Sayu Nato, which includes Shangling and Kaya, as well as Sayu Aggravate, which revolves around taking advantage of Fischl's A4 passive, encourages using Sayu's skill for prolonged periods of time on field. So again, two-piece two-piece combos could be viable, but a full Viridescent on her would honestly be the best for these fun teams. With Faruzan, hers is locked by a constellation at C6. When a character that is buffed by Faruzan's burst it deals damage, a skill hit of hers will form an enemy. The skill then deals animal damage as is counted as the same type of hit from her special charge shot of her elemental skill. Its rate of happening also coincides with the duration of Tenacity of the Millilith being exactly 3 seconds. Through this, Faruzan actually becomes a pretty nice support with Tenacity. You could just give her a standard build with attack, timepiece, animo damage bonus cup, and crit hat while still maintaining Tenacity of the Millilith 4 piece. Additionally, while you could typically give her Noblesse like other supports, she usually is paired with Bennett to boost main DPSs of their teams, and since Bennett by default is pretty much given top priority for Noblesse, it wouldn't make sense to give her that since the effects can't stack. 
The next two are Dendry units that take each side of the spectrum. Nahida is a sub-DPS support unit that ultimately deals a good chunk of damage with her passive activation of her skill, and while this skill is mainly activated off-field, it would be quite foolish to put her on Golden Troop. This is due to the fact that Nahida prefers to be on Deepwood to help bolster their strength of Dendro. Yao Yao should also be on Deepwood too, however you can put her on Tenacity. She's an HP scaling healer that has a skill which consistently procs this effect. Aside from being a great support on Deepwood, the only other downside Yao Yao would have on Tenacity is that she would have a bit of downtime on this effect during her burst state, since those attacks don't count as skill hits. And as for the last character, it actually is just a bit of clarification on how their kit works. Gaming is a plunge attack DPS, who activates this by tapping his elemental skill. The first activation allows for him to come into contact with the surface, and then launch himself into the air. After that, he can then activate it again by performing a plunge attack. This would seem that a two-piece, two-piece combo of Crimson Witch and Golden Troop could work well, but this isn't the case. The first activation doesn't deal any damage, therefore not counting as a hit with his elemental skill. And the special plunging attack that he does after getting launched into the air isn't counted as elemental skill damage or a hit from his skill. It's solely counted as a plunge attack, so Golden Troop just can't activate. Now, wait just a minute. I know I said that there was going to be a whopping 17 characters to talk about, but while I was making this video, 4.5 started, and with it came the release of Chiori. Now, Chiori is a bit of a complex unit, but holds a lot of similarities to Albedo. She's a Geo sub DPS unit that summons a little doll that essentially deals Geo damage at intervals of exactly 3.6 seconds. And if there's a Geo construct on fields, another one of these dolls spawn on that field. Her kit ties her to needing another Geo unit, preferably one that can create a construct. That limits the options to Zhongli, Ito, Albedo, Ningguang, and Geo Traveler. This usually means that she already is typically locked into Mono Geo. Tenacity would not make sense on her at all, since there are so many things that just wouldn't work. Her damage split scales off of attack and defense, so HP doesn't help. If she were to be used as a flex unit in a team that doesn't use a Geo Construct producing character, she would have a 0.6 second downtime in proccing the four piece effect. Golden Troop actually makes the most sense due to her being an off-field sub-DPS unit, dealing a lot of skill damage. The duration of the dolls is just a second longer than her cooldown, which means that she can just as easily bring them back out with no problem. It's important to understand that the Husk set also acts as a suitable option for her since her split scaling depends on defense just a bit more than attack. So, Golden Troop and Tenacity of the Milith are honestly some of the best artifacts that the game has to offer, aside from the obvious ones like Viridescent and Noblesse and whatnot, of course. It provides strength to teams in different ways while also being able to clearly separate sub-DPS and support units for the sake of simplicity. In the past, I've always kept finding these comparisons of sets that seem to be more offensive while others are more defensive, and usually it's almost always been determined by a majority of the player base that the more offensive geared units seem to be better than the defensive ones in the end. However, this time it's actually not the case. Tenacity is the more defensive option of the two and it has held its own ground against Golden Troop, especially having it being released before Golden Troop. This works because Tenacity serves a role that Golden Troop just can't provide, and vice versa. The only thing in common is the focus on elemental skills, but other than that, both sets take different ways to exploit it without any overlap. And if they were to overlap, then I guess I would be telling a whole different story. Currently, I would say that Tenacity and Golden Troop are pretty well balanced, and there really isn't any clear winner. When considering the characters that would actually use either of these sets seriously, we have 5 for Golden Troop, with Albedo, Fischl, Farina, Yaimiko, and Chiori, while Tenacity has 7 with Dea, Kuki, Layla, Kokomi, Zhongli, and Yao Yao along with Farazan, although the last two are more situational given Deepwood being made for Dendro supports like Yao Yao, and needing to obtain C6 for Farazan to make Tenacity work. Disregarding the last two, it makes a perfect 50-50 split down the middle. So yeah, no winner or loser in the general scheme of things. Knowing this, if Golden Troop was able to somehow buff a tiny bit of all party members' damage when the wielder was off-field, or if Tenacity was able to provide a bit of increased skill damage based on a percentage of the equipped character's HP or something of that sort, then that overlap would probably make one artifact set somewhat of a clear winner. It's actually pretty refreshing to see something like this, since usually there's one that's usually better in almost all situations, so I'm glad that the outcome was quite different this time. So yeah, this was quite a long video. The script is actually like 8 pages long, and I definitely need a break from talking. 
I'm thinking of starting a new series on my channel so that y'all don't have to wait so long for a video from me while I work on bigger, chunkier ones. Again, I'm always grateful for your patience and love whenever I put out a video, so thank you so, so much. You already know what button to press if you want to see more on a regular basis, and if you have something to say, I can only hope that it's nice. Thank you, and bye!